All right, so we'll go ahead and jump right in here. So uh, we'll talk about the why it's relevant to us in infectious disease. Um, I got a little carried away with the history section. So that's, the, that's, the fun part. That, that's what I think. So yeah, so we'll talk a lot about history of biologic warfare and we'll talk about a few of the kind of more relevant biologic agents at the end that, that we're familiar with them. Um, this is a quote from Jesus. He said, you will be hearing of wars and Rumors of wars, uh, see that you are not alarmed for these things hey, about the But for these things must take place, but that is not yet the end. In this chapter in the Bible, he's basically talking about the end times. He's talking about the end of the world. And he's basically saying there's going to be all the end of the war world. So. If you're one of those people that likes to say a prayer and drink to world peace, it's probably not going to happen. So we all need to be prepared for <laughs> biological warfare um, <clears throat> because war will be with us until the end of time. And we see wars around the world. Uh, you have the Ukrainian-Russian conflict that we're all familiar with, uh, Russia being a major world power. Um, and I don't know. Uh, but they have a long history with, uh, we'll talk about later a little bit of the history of Russia and their, um, one of the, basically the most sophisticated bio, uh, uh, biological warfare programs in the history of the world was in the Soviet Union. And they had huge stockpiles of anthrax and smallpox that, um, they had stocked up on during this, well, they were part of the, well, they were the Soviet Union and, and we never really figured out what happened to all those biologic weapons. Where did they destroy them? Do they still have them? We don't know. Um, and then you've got this tension between uh, China and Taiwan. There's a lot of tension between these two nations. Um, <clears throat> and China is another major world power. Uh, and who knows what they've been doing in terms of potential biologic weapons. We know that they were experimenting on coronaviruses and things China like virus. that. So. And then you've got other uh, wars going on. Uh, this is a picture, just uh, the war in Sudan recently was in the news. Um, you know, it's not a new conflict. There's been a war going on in Sudan for quite some time. Uh, but it showed up in the news recently because you had uh, one of the warring parties got, uh, there was fighting in uh, uh, Khartoum and um the RSF, one of the warring parties, got in control of this micro lab there, which contains like measles and also cholera and I think also polio. And so it was sort of a there's some concerns about what was going to happen with that. I think there's a ceasefire right now, but I'm not really sure. I haven't stayed up on the more recent news. Hasn't been going on for a while. I don't. Okay. I don't know. <clears throat> So uh, definite, just a few definitions. So like a biologic weapon is kind of defined as a, a pathogenic microorganism or a neurotoxin that could be produced by a microorganism that is used as a weapon uh, to cause death or disease, usually on a large scale. Um, biologic warfare is when you use biologic weapons in the context of warfare. And, and a little bit different is biologic terrorism, which is the use of biologic weapons by kind of non-state organizations, groups, or persons to cause harm. So jumping right into some of the history of uh, the use of biologic weapons and biologic warfare, the earliest uh, uh, use of biologic weapons that we can see historically was really with the Hittites. They were warring in the Middle East with Egypt at the time, and they there are some records that indicate that they drove tularemia infected people and livestock into enemy Egyptian lands and actually may have been responsible for causing a pretty significant um, epidemic of tularemia in the Middle East at the time. <clears throat> and then in around 500 BC, of course, you had the rise of the Roman Empire and Roman soldiers were known to dip their swords into corpses and then their uh, wounded enemies, when they would wound enemies, they would um, sometimes get tetanus. And they probably also got a lot of other infections, if you, you know, about. <laughs> 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 
Yeah, I'm sure there are other infections that probably occurred there too. Um, and then 1155, you have this Emperor Frederick Barbosa, and he, uh, in one of his Italian campaigns, he um, poisoned water wells with human bodies. Human bodies into water wells probably caused some disease there. And then, um, you know, moving on to uh, like kind of B, uh, more B, later BC, you've got 13, um, or AD, I should say, you've got 1346, Genghis Khan and the Mongols, uh, Eastern kind of Europe. Um, and uh, during their siege, uh, Kaffa, the city Kaffa, they catapult plague bodies. You have the bubonic plague occurring at this time, and they would catapult plague bodies over the city walls. Um, may have contributed to some of the spread of the bubonic plague at the time. Um, and then in 1495, Spanish, uh, where this is kind of nasty, they mixed wine with blood from people infected with leprosy and they sold it to their French enemies. So the moral of the story here is that you shouldn't buy or take food or drink from your enemies. It's <laughs> probably not a good idea. <laughs> so I don't know if that actually caused leprosy in anybody, but they did that. They tried that. And then I thought this was pretty interesting. 1650, the Polish army um, started catapulting glass and clay containers containing saliva from <laughs> rabies infected dogs. So I don't know whose job it was to collect the saliva no. from the rabies infected dogs, but sounds like a pretty dangerous job. <clears throat> and then this is a picture. Uh, no one knows a painting. No one knows really who painted it. It was from around 1437. And it's kind of an allegory of the plague and how contagious it was. You know, you've got this sort of, I don't know if this is a death angel on a horse, um, basically shooting people with arrows with the bubonic plague and their people die. But one of the other ways that, you know, the plague was probably spread was during warfare was that people would actually dip their arrows into people infected with the bubonic plague and then um, shoot them at their enemies. And so that may have contributed in addition to catapulting bodies over city walls, may have contributed to the spread of the bubonic plague in Europe. And then kind of moving into the uh, 1700s, you have the French and Indian War in the 1760s. And there was this uh, siege of Fort Pitt at the time, uh, the, which was actually the Native Americans had sieged this, uh, besieged this fort, surrounded this fort. And there was a a small plot pox outbreak occurring at the time inside the fort and had this sick barracks. And so the uh, leader, the commanding officer at the fort uh, commanded his troops to take blankets from the barracks where there was a smallpox outbreak and then give them to the Native Americans outside. So there was a, a fairly significant smallpox outbreak occurring during this time in the uh, Americas. And so we don't really know how much that actually, if that caused any infections or how much that contributed to it because it was there was already a bunch of outbreaks occurring at the time and then in the revolutionary war 1775 um you know similar issue you had the siege of boston by general george washington and uh <clears throat> british general william howe um in, you know who was inside boston that was being sieged he may have sent smallpox infected civilians out of the city to try to affect continental troops um, George Washington was very, he was very smart, um, and he had commanded that all of his troops be inoculated with smallpox um, during the Revolutionary War. So most of his troops were actually immune at this time. And George Washington himself, he had smallpox when he was a child and recovered from it. So he was also immune. And inoculation is a little different than vaccination. Inoculation, they would uh, basically take um, a, from someone who had smallpox, they would take a lesion, kind of unproof it. Um, and then they would create a cut in someone that didn't have smallpox and sort of inoculate from the lesion that they picked up somebody with smallpox. And it would cause a smallpox infection, but it was usually much more mild than, you know, if you had uh, uh, contracted it otherwise. And it would and typically uh, gave someone lifelong immunity. Basis for think. Yeah, I mean, Edwin Jetter, about a decade later or so, I believe, um, kind of developed the concept of vaccination with cowpox. So, but that was, I think, about a dec decade after, exactly. late, late, uh, early 1800s, late 1700s, around that time. 
And in the Civil War, there is this record of uh, some Confederate soldiers selling some clothes to U.S. troops that were infected with yellow, yellow fever or from people that were infected with yellow fever and smallpox. So again, just don't take, uh, don't buy things or take things from your enemy. You don't know what they are trying to sell you. So, and then the post, uh, post-Civil War period between 1860 and 1900, you really have the development of germ theory. And when you have World War I in kind of the early 1900s, 1914 to 1918, uh, biologic warfare becomes much more sophisticated with development of germ theory. Um, so that's just Louis Pasteur up there, who is one of the pioneers of germ theory um, and infectious disease in general. Um, and during World War One, it was really the Germans that uh, uh, started to utilize biologic warfare, mostly in the um, mostly they used it for sabotage purposes to sabotage livestock with the Allied nations. Um, and actually, in 1915, there was this um, German physician Anton Bilger. And he was raised in, uh, he was American, he was raised in Germany, went to medical school in Germany, and he came back to the United, United States in 1915. This is before the United States entered the war. Uh, I don't think the United States entered the war until 1918, but they were based, they were sending a lot of livestock overseas to the Allied nations so that, uh, to support them. <clears throat> and so he set up a basement in Washington, D.C., and actually started to grow uh, smallpox, or not smallpox, um, anthrax and glanders and put them and suspend them in test tubes and then they recruited a bunch of people that basically went around all these docks on the eastern coast that were getting ready to ship animals out like horses out to the to europe and they would inject the horses and um and the livestock and killed a bunch of you know basically sabotaging killing a lot of livestock for the war effort there the american physician was yeah because essentially, he's right. He was a German. He was a German. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he was, uh, yeah, he was, um, yeah, he was born in America, but he grew up in Germany, exactly. trained in Germany. Yeah. So he's technically probably an American citizen and was able to come back here. And, and it was during this time, German government was under a lot of more, iso- they were more isolated too. And they, they had relations with Europe, but it wasn't as probably just stayed there. Yeah. Right. Um, <clears throat> so that was with anthrax and glanders. They also, uh, the Germans, you know, sabotaged, uh, during the Romanian Russian animal trade, they sabotaged a lot of animals. there using the same methods. Um, Spanish horses were targeted during the uh, world war one by the Germans. They would feed them sugar cubes that were infected with these agents. And then, um, Norwegian reindeer, they also targeted them as well. So. It was pretty sophisticated. And of course, Glanders disease is Burkholderia, Malii. Um, so after World War I, 1925, you know, it was a brutal war, um, especially with the use of chemical weapons more so. I mean, people remember the chemical weapons, mustard gas and that kind of a thing that were used in World War I. So they developed the Geneva Protocol um, as a kind of a protocol for prohibition of, you know, anaphyxating poisonous gases. But it, they all, it also included the... Uh, use of bacteriologic methods of warfare as something that these nations were kind of decided on, on a prohibition of the use of those agents in warfare. Um, so then you get into the post-World War II period or post-World War I period, kind of 1930s to 1945. Um, and it was really the Japanese during World War II that implemented kind of the largest scale use of biologic weapons in the history of the world and they had a very pretty sophisticated uh, biologic warfare program headed up by this uh Shiro Ishii I don't know if that's how you say his name but it sounds sounded right to me it's a <laughs> yeah. so Shiro Ishii uh <laughs> he, he this unit 731 was this biologic warfare program headed up by the Japanese and he's the one that that, that led this um and it was a uh, pretty extensive biologic warfare program that they implemented and they experimented on civilians. They experimented on a lot of prisoners. Um, and it included inoculate the Chinese probably took the brunt of it. Um, they inoculated a bunch of Chinese water wells with cholera and typhus, and they actually started dropping ceramic bombs containing bubonic plague and infested fleas over Chinese cities. 
and um, ultimately may have been responsible for killing up to a half a million Chinese. Um, and then they they had this uh, plan. They called it Operation Cherry Blossoms at Night. Uh, towards the end of World War II, they were losing the war at this point, and they were planning to fly airplanes over to San Francisco um, in Southern California, city major cities in Southern California, including uh, I believe San Francisco, where they were going to drop. Uh, bombs containing fleas with bubonic plague. <clears throat> and that was, they had a whole date plan for it. It was going to be September 22nd, 1945. But then, boom. The uh, atomic bomb ended World War II. So this plan, this plan to, you know, ca- to use biologic weapons against the United States uh, never came into effect. Um, of course, with the use of the atomic bomb, Japan uh, finally surrenders. And you have the end of World War II. And so you kind of move into the post-World War II period. So, um, you know, you have 19, really during the early parts of World War uh, II, the United States had kind of started developing its own bio, bio, log, biologic warfare program. Um, and, that tra- and that continued through, through the war and into the post-World War, War II period. Um, and they, they were more using it. it biologic warfare development in terms of like how to protect against biological warfare agents. Um, they ran a bunch of in like how, you know, how would somebody use biological warfare against the United States and then, you know, what could we do to maybe curtail that? So they did a bunch of field tests in the 1950s um, where they, were, without telling anybody, they released clouds uh, from ships containing what they felt was a harmless biologic agent, which was serratia. Um, we all know that that's not harmless, like get infections with serratia. But they released it in clouds from naval ships off Norfolk, Virginia, and San Francisco. Infected a whole bunch of people. Um, we don't know if anybody died. Died. I think one person may have died from infection at that time. That could have been related to it, but they never were able to prove. It. Um, and then, kind of famously, they did these mock anthrax attacks in the 1960s. Probably the most famous one was in 1966. They contaminated the New York metro system with a harmless bacillus globigii, sort of a um, uh, an agent that they used uh, to kind of represent, I guess, uh, anthrax, um, and then to see like how many people would get infected with it. Um, <clears throat> and uh, then you kind of move into the 1970s, and uh, it was Richard Nixon and, um, and uh, a bunch of... Uh, more than 100 other nations signed the Biologic and Toxic Weapons Convention, the BTWC. Um, and, and it was signed by the US, Russia, and the UK, and then more than 100 other nations. And this uh, kind of treaty that they signed um, prohibited the research of biologic weapons, in addition to, you know, the Geneva Protocol was like, you don't, you know, don't use biologic weapons of warfare. And this uh, treaty, or the convention was more targeting. Don't you don't even develop biologic weapons. Stop developing them. And so the United States had a bunch of stockpiles, I believe, at this time of biologic weapons that they destroyed. Um, and so they, you know, these nations signed this. Of course, we all remember Richard Nixon for uh, Watergate. But I think this was a, a good thing that he kind of was uh, a leader in um, in doing this uh, with other nations in the world. Um, of course, Russia. They signed this as well, but at the same time, they were probably already starting to work on a very sophisticated biological warfare program as part of the Soviet Union called Biopreparat. Um, and Biopreparat is something that maybe started in 1974, but probably started earlier than that, and it continued through the end of the Soviet Union. Very large scale, employed more than 50,000 people, um, very large scale bio, biological warfare program. Um, they stocked up on, uh, you know, huge stockpiles of smallpox and also anthrax, other agents. Um, this Nikolai Ustinov, he died from injecting himself with Marburg virus. I'm not sure why you would inject yourself with Marburg virus, but he did that. He died from it. They, like, re-isolated it from him and kept running experiments on it. Um, and then you know, they had... Several outbreaks of smallpox, glanders, and anthrax during the 1970s in Russia. And of course, the Russian secret police were trying to cover it up and blame it on, you know, more environmental factors rather than than leaks from labs, basically, at the time. 
And then you've got the, you know, the collapse of the Soviet Union in 19, late 1980s. And so at that point, all the biological warfare programs are supposedly halted. And um, but we don't really know what happened to all the stockpiles, biologic weapons. Were they, do they still have them? Were they destroyed? We're not really sure. I thought this was kind of interesting. One of the ways the Russians kind of knew that the United States was working on something during World War II is that they would look at the, the, the top U.S. physicists and how many publications they had during those years. And when the publications would go down, like the top U.S. physicists during World War II weren't publishing anything. And it's because they were working on the atomic bomb. And so the same thing happened in Russia. And if you compare these two um, Russian scientists, this Sandakchev, Sandakchev, or I'm really sure how to say his name, but he was researching smallpox as part of the Russian bio warfare program. And you can see like during the, and if you compare his publications, he's black, he's the one in black. And then this other scientist, Krilov, is in white. You can see that like during the 1980s and 1970s, I mean, he's not publishing anything really, and so he's working on smallpox and biological. <laughs> yeah, I guess Kirillov was doing others. He you know, wasn't a big part of it, but um, <clears throat> and then you have bioterrorism, like the 1980s to present time. Uh, so if really now, and you know, from the 19 the collapse of the Soviet Union until now, it's you know, the use of biologic weapons has been more of a threat in terms of bioterrorism. Um, rather than biologic warfare, there hasn't been another world war, um, and we've been have really several instances of the use of bioterrorism during this the last several decades. Um, 1984, the Rajneesh cult um, in Dallas, Oregon, they intentionally contaminated a bunch of salad bars with salmonella, caused this big outbreak. Um, some people spent a long time in jail for that. <clears throat> And then in 2001, of course, you had the anthrax lace letters shortly after 9-11, um, infected 22 people, caused five deaths. And then since that time, it's really been fairly quiet. We haven't seen any. any that you know. That we know. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> and pe people have died mysterious deaths in different parts of the world. Um, you know, in Russia, there's been you know, definitely like mysterious deaths that have occurred and people that have opposed sort of their government there. And, you know, there's always been questions about well, could some of that have been, you know, biologic weapons or, or whatnot or other you know, chemical weapons. Who knows? So um, that kind of brings us to, to like now our present time. And, you know, what do we need to be thinking about in terms of biologic weapons in infectious disease? Um, <clears throat> Certainly, you know, the world is continues to be a volatile place and there's always the risk of, you know, um, you know, a military conflict that could could result in the use of biologic weapons. And then bioterrorism is always a threat um, that that could become, you know, that could come back and occur as well. So the CDC, they kind of categorize your your biologic weapons into three different categories. Um, category A is like your highest priority. So these are very easily transmitted and disseminated um, infections that have a very high mortality rate, and they have the potential to cause a major public health impact, and they may cause public uh, and panic and social disruption. That all sounds sounds kind of familiar to a recent pandemic that we had, where you had COVID-19. You know, it was very transmissible, right? Very easily disseminated had a fairly high mortality in the right population group, and then um, did cause a lot of pop, potential major public health impact, may cause, uh, and it definitely caused a lot of panic and social disruption. Um, so you can see how like coronaviruses could be utilized as a, as a biologic weapon. Um, category B, uh, sort of the second highest priority, moderate transmissibility, and we'll give some examples of these, modest morbidity and low mortality. And then your category C is, um, I don't know what I was saying there, highest propriety. I'm not sure. Priority. Third, third highest uh, priority. Right. Sorry, we both kind of stay. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so these are more emerging. The third category is emerging pathogens that could potentially be, you know, engineered to uh, and used in the future to call to be used as biologic weapons. So category A, some uh, examples. You've got anthrax, botulism, plague, uh, smallpox. Tularemia, 
and then the hemorrhagic fevers, of course, and these all kind of definitely all meet these uh, criteria that they're talking about as far as transmissibility, mortality. Um, the plate, you know, tularemia is very transmissible and it can be aeros it can be potentially aerosolized and transmitted in that way. Um, I would, you know, they have, the CDC hasn't updated their website to include coronaviruses um, and they're not even mentioned in any of the categories, but I would imagine the next time they update it that we would probably see it included there eventually. I, I think it would probably fit into category A, maybe category C if you're thinking that it's more something that could be like engineered to be more dangerous or something like that. But, and then category B, you've got a, a bunch of different agents here, um, you know, brucellosis, um, some of the viral encephalo encephalitis um, infections, um, and then some other toxin like staphylococcus, uh, enterotoxin, ricin toxin. Um, and interestingly, you got like psittacosis, Q fever. Um, and then category C, these are more of the, you know, Napa virus, hantavirus are, Things that could potentially be um, re more, more research, you know, engineering utilized uh, for bio, bio weapons. I wasn't really familiar with Napa virus. It's a, apparently a zoonotic virus. Yeah, fruit bats. Fruit bats, yes. Bats are the, the it's South, Southeast Asia and goes to Africa too. So. Okay. Yeah, fruit bats, they just migrate. Gotcha. Yeah. Oh, that's a number virus. It's a number virus. You mean hantavirus? Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, yes, hantavirus, of course, you know, high mortality and you can't, there's nothing to treat it with. Um, so, all right. So we're just going to talk about a few of just three of these agents that, that, that I think are most important in, in bioterrorism to think about. So what is this? Yeah, that is definitely teams. Since we're talking about bioterrorism, that's definitely anthrax. You have this necrotic escar lesion, this anthrax. Um, so I don't know why that didn't go forward. One more. Oh, there we go. <clears throat> so bacillus anthracis, bacillus anthracis. So it can cause cutaneous inhalation or gastrointestinal forms. Um, and so you can see like you have the cutaneous intestinal and then pulmonary um, or inhalation route of infection. Um, and it's this, you know, these spores, you in, in, inhale the spores or the spores get into your skin or they get uh, into your GI tract and then infect your GI mucosa. Um, and then they are able to, they get phagocytosed by macrophages where they can kind of germinate and um, and then once inside the macrophage where they spend a significant part of their uh, life cycle, you get this, you know, they, the, to the uh, toxin of the anthrax bacteria is really what causes a lot of the morbidity and mortality. And it's, you know, you've got this edema toxin and the lethal toxin. The edema toxin um, stimulates cyclic AMP, which causes a lot of uh, basically um, fluid capillary leak. So in the lungs, that's going to cause a lot of pulmonary edema. And then blood vessels, of course, that's going to cause a lot of, um, you know, hypotension, shock, uh, intravascular depletion. And then the lethal toxin is, you know, can cause apoptosis of cells and then lead to uh, a lot of cytokine, kind of a cytokine storm type of picture where you get shock, you know, septic shock and death. And then just some other pictures of this cutaneous uh, anthrax with sort of this uh, lymphangitic spread, this lymphangitis that you can see here. From you know coming from lesion, um, <clears throat> and then inhalation in anthrax. So the incubation is like a, a, a one to seven days, and there's kind of this biphasic clinical presentation, which is really important because you want to treat them during the prodrome phase. So, which is really non-specific. They can present with malaise, flu-like symptoms for four to five days, and then they go into this fulminant phase where they have progressive, rapid hypoxic respiratory failure, shock, and death. And it's almost uniformly fatal once they go into this fulminant phase. And then about half of patients um, will also develop a hemorrhagic meningitis um, during that fulminant phase. And the chest imaging, classically, you'll see the wide mediastinum. Um, you can also, that's the hilar abnormality. So wide mediastinum on a chest x-ray in the right clinical context is, you know, kind of classic for anthrax, pulmonary anthrax. Uh, so you can have, also have consolidations, pleural effusions. 
And again, you need to initiate antibiotics during the prodrome phase. If it goes into the fulminant phase, they're probably going to die. So it's really important to get a good history. Expect this is more like a sporadic thing or, you know, um, and try to figure out what's going on from the get go, because otherwise it might just look like they've got a, you know, a viral infection. Um, and then treatment of the anthrax. Uh, so, you know, it's a pretty complicated uh, treat, uh, treatment regimens for anthrax. I mean, first line is multiple, multiple agents. Um, you know, it's, it spends a significant amount of its time intracellularly. And so uh, in terms of its life cycle, so you want an agent that's going to have good intracellular concentration, like ciprofloxacin is kind of the preferred agent for um, anthrax. But then you want to also combine it with uh, meropenem, so two different kind of bacterial cytal agents, and then also a protein synthesis inhibitor because the toxin is sort of the a lot of the pathophysiologic way that it causes um, you know uh, major disease and death. Um, so adding like clindamycin or linazolid um, as a protein synthesis inhibitor is important. And then there's also this antitoxin that you can give, so raxa, basumab, or oblito. Uh, Obilotaxumab, or you can do anthrax IgG if you don't have one of the antitoxins available. And then, how long do you treat these people? Remember, a long time. You know why? So you actually treat them. You can. You're supposed to treat them. It depends, but you're supposed to treat them for at least like 60 days. Why? Why? Why would you have? To, why would you treat someone 60 days? Like, it seems like a long time to treat someone with antibiotics that doesn't have osteomyelitis. The spores, yeah. So yep. if they inhale spores, they could take a long time to germinate. So the thought is that if you stop treatment early and then you've got spores that germinate later, you know, they could have a relapse and have significant issues there. And then what do you do in pregnancy? The same thing. The same thing. Yeah, it's like the only time I <laughs> ciprofloxacin. <laughs> the first time you, the only time you ever use ciprofloxacin in pregnancy that I'm aware of. Um, so yeah, same as non-pregnant. And second line, if you've got issues with problems with some of the first line agents, you know, you can use another foreign quinolone, which doesn't really make sense. I feel like if you can't use one, why would you be able to use another? Um, you can use another carbapenem again. Why would you use one, not another, unless there was like not gonna have probably resistance? Um, but vancomycin is an alternative, I guess, if you had a severe like anaphylaxis to meropenem. Maybe you could use, uh, you know, vancomycin instead. And then there's other, you know, you can use other protein synthesis inhibitors, right? Damp and doxycycline if there's an issue with clindamycin and polymazolid. So you treat pregnant people the same way. You need to treat them for at least 60 days. And it's like three different antibiotics. Make sure you have the protein synthesis inhibitor in there because of the toxemia. Um, yeah, and then you treat IV for like two weeks and then followed by a, yeah, so it's IV times two weeks, and then you do a single agent monotherapy like Cipro for 60 days. So the combination therapy is only for the first two weeks. That does not have to be IV too, initially? I mean, they say IV, con I think it's probably the Cipro and the meropenem. I think it's just because of how they need to get the adequate levels. Yeah. yeah. And so it's essentially, all this is very, very just arbitrary, like this is just the, Put the kitchen sink on them because they're gonna die. So that's yeah, we have to use. And um, I mean, you know, Cipro gets good bioavailability. It may wouldn't, you know. I mean, I'm sure you could probably use it as PO, but most people are pretty sick. And yeah, again, I think. And what about the transmissibility between patients? How transmissible is it? Like I'm sure, between, I'm sure, I'm sure. like I know you do a bio <laughs> Back and inhale the spores. But. Yeah, yeah. I don't. So I, I don't think that you that uh, anthrax is transmissible between yeah. people. Do you, do you guys know what profession? So I know we're doing bioterrorism, but that's a rare event. Yeah. Professions at risk for anthrax. Other than mailmen. Other yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> does anyone know where it's naturally occurring? Secret agents. Uh, yeah, it's naturally occurring. Oh, well, but there's there's animal. Veterinarians, right? Sheep, so sheep. Yeah. Oh, okay. Veterinarians, of course, yeah. but no yeah. better. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Wolf sorters yeah. disease. There we go. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. The other issue is, you know, when you're looking at that and the spores is right and you can use PO, none of these have been 
actually looked at in humans are all animal model, and that was the Cipro approval. You won't know early on if it's been weaponized, so if it's been made resistant to other antibiotics, and that was the big concern with the um, the only U.S. large um, bioweapon attack. I mean, the Rajneeshi was different. They, they wanted to control an election, so they're trying to make people sick in the DALs. So this was different. And inhalational is really bad because remember when you're, you get that, you know, you have toxin factor and lethal factor, they create, uh, you, your cyclic AMP just goes crazy. So you're making huge amounts of pleural effusion. And some of those people that were ended up in the unit that came out in the New England Journal when those were published, they were having problems keeping their electrolytes normal because they were putting out two to three to four liters of fluid just from their uh, chest tubes. So the management of them is really difficult. Um, so that's one of the big issues with anthrax. One of the other issues that, you know, nobody talks about, I mean, we talk about it being skin or, you know, GI. GI could be a real huge problem in trying to make it diagnosed. Um, if you, you know, contaminated, you know, uh, gave it to a cow or whatever, um, and they didn't get that sick, if you had a steak that had anthrax on it, you're probably not going to get it because you're searing the steak. But if you grind it up into, you know, ground beef, and then you add the spores, just think of the surface area now that has spores in it, and you're not going to get the inside of that hamburger hot enough to kill the spores. So that's one other area that people have been very anxious about was somebody trying to do a bioweapon attack uh, wherever in the world by using in um, things like that, things that have been ground up, things that have a lot of surface area as opposed to a small surface area like a steak. This is Anthony. So when it comes down to it, there's two points here about anthrax that are important. Uh, Jimmy Moreno put in the, in the chat a very important point. So a lot of the disease that we see here in the States um, comes from products from the African continent. So it is actually endemic in parts of sub-Saharan Africa, and a lot of different large herbivores actually die of anthrax. So if you see an animal that's dead if, while on safari and no other animals are around it eating it, uh, besides vultures, it's because it's probably died of anthrax. Um, interestingly, to kind of copy, kind of go down what John was saying, uh, you know, the, the, the group at UF Lake Nona, actually in, two, in 2018 and 19, at the CDC request, <clears throat> created a cipro-resistant and bacillus anthracis. And the reasoning was to, uh, you know, kind of go down exactly what Will is trying to describe here. So that there is resistance to fluoroquinolones, as the U.S. was, you know, requested Bayer to stockpile ciprofloxacin back in 2001 in Pittsburgh. Uh, you know, now we have a blueprint as to what antimicrobials we can use because of the UF Lake Nona group. Uh, it's a very interesting paper. Um, University of Florida media people uh, actually uh, actually had a stroke when it came out, uh, but it was a sentinel paper uh, and they presented it at a national meeting for, you know, for ASM uh, after the CDC had requested it. And it created so much media frenzy um, that the, the, the university didn't know what to do with it. It's a very important point that we now have a blueprint of what to do with fluoroquinolone resistant bacillus and thracis. And because of the scientists over there that um, have been working on, on B and thracis probably for 30, 40 years. The other question is, how long do you treat people who've been exposed but not having disease? with Cipro because that came up during the outbreak. They didn't know where it was coming from. So they were looking at a lot of people who were going to be on, you know, two to four months of Cipro prophylactically. Um, there wasn't probably going to be that much Cipro in the United States. So they were looking to Canada to try and get Cipro. It'd be much cheaper. And the Canadian government said, no, thank you. We'll keep our own Cipro just in case something happens here. So there were talks with Bayer about dropping the price, you know, so they could buy enough of it. And basically, Bayer said, no, here's the price. So then the U.S. government said, fine, we'll nationalize your company and we'll take it for free. So Bayer said, OK, we'll give it to you what we sell it to the Canadians. And that's how we ended up getting a lot of Cipro for a national emergency. 
another just quick thing, just something the morning then too, because there was an outbreak about 10 years ago, London, uh, UK, there was an outbreak of anthrax uh, inside of heroin. So I think drug users were getting into I think there was like total only seven, but they love asking this question. The report. So just for the fellows, they all, they might have some sort of etiology with that, though. Something about it. Just Thank one more comment. Um, the supplement ciprofloxacin in the national stockpile reading here. Barda um, purchased um, uh, a monoclonal antibody, Braxovacumab, and also anthrax in the globulin as other treatments available for, for anthrax. Uh, well, so. Excellent. Yeah, you're supposed to. You're Ideally, you're supposed to give the antitoxin with your antibiotic regimen, um, and that is one of them, the raxabasumab. And if you don't have that, then you could use anthrax IgG if that's available. And there's also the oblidotaximab as well, other one. So thank you, everybody, Dr. Kano, Dr. Tony. Um, um, in terms of the post-exposure prophylaxis that Dr. Tony was uh, referring to, you're supposed to give it to anybody that was potentially exposed. Um, and ideally begin it as fast as possible, 48 hours. Um, <clears throat> and you're, you can do Cipro, it's just a single agent. You can do Cipro or Doxy, um, and then plus vaccination. And then you do it for 42 to 60 days. Basically, if you're um, younger, less than 65 and otherwise healthy, you can just get away with 42 days. Um, if you complete the post-exposure vaccine. So if you're Young and healthy, you can get away with a shorter course. Um, all right, so that's anthrax. What is this going on with this course? Is that a... It's an infected leg. Yeah, I mean, we're talking, yeah. So this is a, this is a bubo, or bubos. So, and actually bubo is the, I think the Greek word for groin. And so this was, in plague, this, the groin is the most common place where you would get these these buboes, these enlarged, um, inflamed lymph nodes. So and really not being black is throwing everyone off. <laughs> when that happens, yeah, you can necros. it can get get they get necrotic and um can kind of be have form an escar type necrotic basically lymph node. So the plague, you're seeing a pestis, gram negative cocobacillus, zoonotic infections. Humans are a completely incidental host. Um, it's usually, it's transmitted by infected fleas, usually with um, in, uh, intermediate hosts being uh, mice and other rodents, um, as well as other animals. Um, and then the way that you be transmitted again, an infected flea bite, um, you could get it from handling or consuming infected animal tissue. And then, of course, in a, inhalation of aerosolized droplets or secretions um, from other humans that are infected or animals is another route of transmission. And of course, uh, the there's three different kind of forms or presentations of disease. You have purely bubonic plague, which is when you get the buboes from usually from a, a flea bite, and then you have septicemic plague, and then uh, pneumonic plague. Um, so bubonic plague is like the vast majority of the infections that you'll see. It's the 85 to 95 percent of cases are from a flea bite um, that can form this escar lesion with a regional kind of regional painful and Arithmetic lymphadenopathy, um, you know, with fevers and chills, and then up to 50% of the people that have the bubonic plague type will progress to the septicemic uh, plague, um, where they'll become septic um, <clears throat> and have like septic shock. They can have they can develop secondary pneumonic plague when they're when they're in the septic septicemic plague um, form, and they can also get meningitis. And then septicemic plague, 10 to 20% of those don't have, not have a, a, a bubonic presentation prior to developing septicemic plague. Um, and then the pneumonic plague uh, can be primary or secondary. So it can be, again, secondary from a septicemic form of plague, or it can be primary from actual inhalation of infected um, aerosolized uh, droplets. And it's, pneumonic plague is rapidly fatal, um, causes severe pneumonia, with hemoptysis is kind of characteristic. Um, and the, that capacity for aerosolization is what really makes this a, a, a bioterrorism threat. 
this is a waste and stain of your Yersinia pestis, and I just wanted to point out the safe skin kind of appearance on the waste and stain where you got that bipolar staining. So it's with a waste and stain. Um, and then, you know, it's so you have, you know, if the flea bites you, you have this neutrophil response, and then there's this process of what's called epherocytosis, where a macrophage will actually ingest or start coming in and cleaning up these neutrophils that have been attacking this bacteria. And then they might, these macrophages, so the, the Yersinia pestis kind of actually lives inside these macrophages, and then the macrophages migrate to regional lymph nodes. And then in the, that, those regional lymph nodes is kind of the pre-inflammatory phase is when you, they form these buboes, and then you have kind of replication of the bacteria there. Um, and they have this uh, TTS, TTSS, which is this uh, tox, uh, I think it's three toxin secretion system or tri toxic secretion system, which kind of helps it to survive extracellularly. And then, of course, they're a gram negative organism, so they have all this LPS. And so once they get extracellular and start replicating extracellularly and, and spilling into the bloodstream, you get this huge shock, uh, septic shock kind of response. And kind of a similar deal with the in, with the inhalation form, except for you know it's pulmonary alveolar macrophages, and you get a lot of pulmonary edema and everything. So, um, <clears throat> and the treatment of bubonic plague, you know, aminoglycosides have been sort of the cornerstone treatment. Um, or you can use you know foreign quinolones, tetracyclines if it's strictly bubonic. You know, it has a significant portion of its cell cycle intracellularly. So you want to use like something that gets intracellular concentrations. Um, and, you know, tetracycline, if it's septicemic or pneumonic plague, you want to avoid the tetracyclines. Um, just there's been increased mortality in animal models with tetracyclines and uh, septicemic plague. And that's animal models, but and beta lactins are not recommended. Probably some of it might be poor intracellular concentration. Again, they, you know, they're living inside macrophages for a significant portion of the life cycle. I don't know if there, you know, maybe some issues with resistance, uh, but they've been less effective in multiple animal modules, beta lactin. So you want to avoid beta lactins with the plague. Um, and then it can cause meningitis. If that happens, you're supposed to use foreign quinolones and chloramphenicol. So one of the few times you would use chloramphenicol. Um, <clears throat> And then you're supposed to, if you think it's a bioterrorism or a viral weapon, you're supposed to use combo therapy. And that's because there could be engineered resistance. So you want to use two agents that are active against it in case one of the agents has had a, a, a bioengineered resistance to it. Um, what's what this? So, so well, gotta yeah. go back. So the reasoning for the contraindication, I talked to some of you about this, the contraindication to beta lactam use. And the treatment of Yersinia pestis has to do with the fact that it has, you know, these things have what are called YOPs, which are Yersinia outer membrane uh, proteins. Um, and what they do is, is that, you know, for a long time, we thought it was the LPS that was directly causing the immune cascade and the profound mortality from the septicemia due to, you know, due to the organism. It turns out that's not the case. It's really what are called YOPs, which are these Yersinia outer membrane proteins, and they do several things. One of the things, they, they, two of the, the proteins are actually profound. One of them actually creates a soluble IL-1 receptor, and that basically creates a peripheral dam in front of the, the innate immune system, and thus you are unable to, uh, you know, create a good immune response. Another one of them actually cleaves IL-18, which is a precursor of IL-1. So even if there's, you know, you're trying, you know, you're trying to make IL-18 to, to circumvent the IL-1, maybe, you know, surge past the, the amount of receptor that you have, it doesn't really exist. So um, in doing so, if you use beta-lactams, you actually blow up the organism. And in doing so, you create the surge of the YOPs that then will subsequently uh, cause the patient to succumb to the infection a lot quicker. And so, you know, this is this is a real problem. And and one of the other reasons why, you know, I don't like the tangent, the procalcitonin deal is because, you know, in a patient with septicemic plague or pneumonic plague, you will have a negative procal because of the yops and what and how they work. So when it comes down to it, um, that's the reason why and why we only want certain antibiotics 
mainly the ones that are intracellular in origin and also protein synthesis inhibition um, at the core of treatment. How do they appear Great. on auger? Or Yersinia pestis? It depends on the auger. Uh, on uh, McConkey, it looks like hammered copper. So remember that buzzword. And on cheap log auger, they had that fried egg appearance. Those are the two things sometimes that come up. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so we're kind of running out of time, but anybody know what this is just by looking at it? It's chicken pox. But nice try. <laughs> I tricked you. But it is <laughs> not small pox. <laughs> what is the mnemonic for that? So, so this is, I mean, so you have different, uh, basically lesions in different stages of healing. That's why I wanted to show it kind of as a, a differentiation. And then you can see sort of the rose uh, or do drop on a rose petal kind of appearance here with these lesions. So for so, small folks, the same stages? Um, yeah, you can see you've got, yeah, different kind of, yeah, this one's more of an ulcer. And then you've got also these vesicles. So they're all in different stages of healing. And that's uh, characteristic of, Chicken pox versus smallpox, which are going to be all in the same stage, um, it's, you know, this progression. So I'll try to go through this quickly. I know we're way out of time here. And, you know, smallpox um, was eradicated in 1979 through a, a worldwide vaccination program. Um, but there are at least two labs in the world, in the United States and then in Russia, that still supposedly contain small amounts of smallpox. And so it's always been sort of a potential biologic weapon. Um, so variola major and minor are the kind of two forms. They're orthopox viruses, they're DNA viruses, and variola major is uh, the one that has very high mortality, 30 to 50 percent, whereas variola minor is like less than percent. And it's 10 to 14 day uh, incubation period. It's transmitted by respiratory droplets, and humans are the only known host, which is why we were able to eradicate it. And there's actually a bunch of different clinical presentations, which I didn't really know about. Um, there's the ordinary type, which is more than 70%. And this is the ordinary type. You can have confluent versus semi-confluent versus a discrete rash, which I'll show you some pictures of. Um, and then when you have a confluent rash, the mortality super high, greater than 60% versus a semi-confluent or a discrete rash. And then uh, the modified type, similar to the ordinary type, it's just a kind of a milder, it's a more rapid development of the rash, but a milder illness. And it was usually seen in people that had been vaccinated or had received inoculation previously. And then the flat type or the malignant type is usually seen in children. And that's almost, it's usually fatal. And then the hemorrhagic type, which is, you know, seen most commonly in pregnant females, the hemorrhagic type uh, is also has a high fatality rate. And um, prior vaccination for that, the hemorrhagic type was actually not, not protective for that type. Um, so you have the ordinary type of smallpox. And so you, this is a confluent kind of type of smallpox. You can see that you've got lesions that are sticking together. They're like right next to each other, or they're actually starting to coalesce and come together. So there's not a lot of space between the lesions. So on the face of the forearms, if you see that, that's confluent smallpox. And again, that's that high, higher mortality rate greater than 60% compared to the other types. Um, and uh, some other pictures of smallpox. You can see all, again, all of these lesions are in the stage, same stage of healing. Um, and then monkeypox has a, very, was, has a very similar type of rash, usually just not as severe. And then prior to the outbreak in 2022, usually it was the same thing where the lesions would all be in the same state of feeling. But the outbreak in 2022, it was interesting. Some of the rashes had different stages of development at the same time. So, and then again, monkeypox patients are going to be much less toxic appearing, much less ill. Um, and they also usually have lymphadenopathy, which is another distinguishing feature from smallpox. Um, and you know, the rash can progress in sort of this kind of, uh, you know, usually it starts as papules over the face over one to two days. And you can have uh, lesions in the mouth, and then it progresses to the forearms and the entire body. Um, and it usually starts off, they'll start off at these macules, then they'll become papules, and then they'll turn into vesicles, um, and then they'll turn into these kind of pustules that you see here by after about a week. And then 
eventually the lesions kind of they umbilicate and they sort of crust and then they heal. Uh, by day 14, they can have you can have scar a lot of scarring afterwards. Uh, so this is malignant flat type smallpox. The lesions are very flat, of course, um, and actually it can kind of resemble varicella a little bit. Um, and again, that malignant flat type is seen more in children. It's high for fatality rate. And then on the right, there is hemorrhagic type smallpox. And that's usually seen in pregnant females, very high mortality. So sort of see that, you know, the lesions become sort of hemorrhagic. And there's no pustular stage with the flat type. Um, last slide, just the treatments. Uh, pox we used a little we're using for monkeypox uh, last year. And it's a viral protein P37 inhibitor, which is a protein that mediates um, virion envelopment or basically extracellular spread of the virus. So when it envelops the virus, it creates an envelope. Um, and it's a, it's, it's a, something that's maintained throughout a bunch of different types of orthopox viruses, which is why T-pox works for smallpox and monkeypox. And then sidofavir, brimsidofavir, they're DNA polymerase inhibitors that do not require um, viral thymidine kinase. And so they don't have the same, um, they don't get, you know, viruses that become resistant to like GAN cyclovir and whatnot do not have the same, confer the same resistance to like sidofavir and brimsidofavir. Brimsidofavir does not concentrate in the renal tubules compared it's to sidofavir. It's an oral formulation. It has a lipid, uh, I think it's fat, yeah. like, like we binding. We will use it for CMV, but then the U.S. government decided to buy up all the stock and put it in the Indiana Jones warehouse. So, yeah, you can't. Yeah. yeah, it's unfortunate. Yeah, much less nephrotoxic. Exactly. Very broad yeah. spectrum. Works for adenoviruses. Works for orthopox viruses, CMV, um, you know, other viruses. So, so that is uh, that's all I had.